joining us right now uh, at this fielding uh, webinar. It is uh, my great privilege to welcome you to this very, very special session on a book that we are very proud of. Um, you can see the cover, I hope, in, in your screen. I'll take it away in just a few minutes. Um, but, you know, as, as a university press, um, we typically get uh, a lot of submissions. Uh, and, but when I saw uh, what uh, Dr. Jacquin and Dr. Hatcher had uh, proposed, that this day and age, we need to create a new ethical foundation for our very device, uh, divided society. And why not use the clinical APA standards of ethics uh, for everyday people, for carpenters, for business people, for teachers? Uh, and, and this was such a, a terrific and appealing proposal, particularly given the difficulty that our nation is, is going through. Uh, we immediately greenlit it, and I am just so proud of the group of authors that you're going to be hearing uh, over the next hour and a half. Uh, they have agreed to talk a little bit about their chapter. Uh, we will first hear from uh, Dr. Jacquin, who is the Dean of the School of Psychology. And then we will uh, hear of from our students who each worked on a chapter. And at the end, Dr. Hatcher, who's a professor in the clinical psychology program, will, will close uh, the session. So with that, uh, let me take the cover away and hand it over to uh, Dr. Jacquin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We first became interested in the idea of giving away psychology ethical principles and standards by exploring how non-mental health professionals might view key aspects of the psychology ethical principles in relation to their everyday lives. Because psychologists are among those professionals with strong and enforceable ethics standards in place, we wondered whether these standards have potential to offer some means of moral leadership to those outside the field of psychology. In particular, we wondered, how might some of the ethics standards apply for non-psychologists in consideration of their everyday lives and the kind of work in which they may be engaged. Our research sought to understand whether and how some or all of these ethics standards might usefully apply to the everyday lives of adults who are not working in any of the mental health professions. For example, could confidentiality be relevant when a friend tells you a secret? What about privacy concerns in context of burgeoning social media or in medical settings? What kinds of spontaneous examples might a non-psychologist sample generate as to the applicability or the lack thereof for the ethical standards that stringently guide the practice, research, and teaching of professional psychologists? To explore these issues, we posed three research questions. First, which ethics standards are viewed as being most relevant to the everyday lives of non-mental health professionals? Second, which ethics standards are viewed as being least relevant to the everyday lives of non-mental health professionals? And third, what kinds of narratives do participants provide explaining the relevance of these ethics standards to their everyday personal and work lives? We employed a mixed method design to answer these research questions. 12 researchers, several of whom you'll meet today, recruited a total of 133 participants from across the United States, from New York to Hawaii. Participants were adults who were not in any mental health professions. The average age of participants was 37 years, with a range from 18 to 78 years. Participants identified as women and men, and as white or Caucasian, African American or Black, Asian or Pacific Islander, Latinx, and Indigenous American. We chose standards from the American Psychological Association's Ethical Principles of Psychologists 
and code of conduct. Specifically, we chose standards that seemed not exclusively relevant to the practice of psychology. 17 standards were chosen for use in this study. You will learn more about these standards when I present some of the results and as you hear from the other presenters. For each standard, participants were read the standard while reading along on their own copy. Participants were asked to rate the degree of applicability for each standard to their everyday lives. In addition, participants were asked to consider how each ethical standard could be applied to their everyday life and to give narrative examples. All participants gave a relevance rating for each ethical standard. The range of relevance ratings for each standard was one to five. However, none of the average ratings was below three, indicating to us that participants viewed the ethical standards as being relevant to their everyday lives. The standard, standards rated as most relevant were maintaining confidentiality, unfair discrimination, avoidance of false or deceptive statements, boundaries of competence, and harassment. Analyses were conducted to measure the relationships between participant demographic variables such as age and ratings of everyday relevance of the 17 ethics standards. I will share a few of the results with you. The book, of course, provides much more detail. For example, age correlated significantly with delegation of work to others, with older participants reporting greater relevance for the standard. One participant argued, since I'm the youngest guy on the staff and I'm a first year coach, I really don't get to delegate. Another noted, I delegate tasks to my kids or at least attempt to, they are pretty young, to try and show them how to do things. In addition, men rated delegation of work to others as significantly more relevant to everyday life than did women. One man stated, delegation is a big part of what I do. I give them a task and then follow through. A woman noted, in theory, it's extremely relevant. However, this is a weakness of mine. I'm terrible at delegating because I always end up doing it myself. And that's applicable to my work life and home life. Men also rated avoidance of false or deceptive statements as significantly more relevant to everyday life than did women. One man stated, if you can't take anyone at their word on one thing, I would say that maybe you can't take their word for any things. One woman noted, I don't make false statements pertaining to my credentials or my academic degrees. I might stretch the experience, but it's mostly true. Differences were also found across racial and ethnic groups on ratings of unfair discrimination and sexual harassment. White and African-American participants rated unfair discrimination as significantly more relevant to their everyday lives than Asian and Latinx participants. An African-American participant noted, discrimination is something that is extremely important because that's something that as an African-American female, I'm faced with a lot. And having African-American male children and an African-American husband, those are things that we have to deal with on, an, on a regular basis. So discrimination is something that is very important to me. A white participant observed, in my job, I'm constantly working to check my bias, the bias that I know I have grown up with, things that I am completely unconscious of. Similarly, African-American and white participants rate, rated sexual harassment as significantly more relevant to their everyday lives than Latinx participants who rated sexual harassment as more relevant than Asian participants. A white participant noticed, noted, sometimes you might be approaching someone who has been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted and you don't even realize it. So you have to be very careful about touching and asking if it's okay to give you a hug and not just approach somebody, not just invade their space. 
I think that's from work that I am acutely aware of that. An African-American participant observed, it's just been a big spike with a lot of things going on in the world. So I just feel like everybody should be fully aware of their limitations and boundaries as far as what they should and should not do around people because obviously they don't know what common sense is. So they have to teach it at every job training, literally. Although there were minor differences in ratings of some of the ethical standards across certain demographic groups, every standard seemed to hold relevance for most participants in a variety of ways. Although I have provided a few narrative examples, our participants offered many more statements that describe the usefulness or occasionally the lack thereof of the ethical standards for their everyday lives. You will hear more of these narratives in the presentations from the other authors. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you Dr. Jacquin. This was a, that was a wonderful overview of uh, the book and the study uh, about which the, the book is written. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first uh, student author, Courtney Shoemaker. And her chapter is about permission granted, permission denied, informed consent and recordings. Thank you. So uh, this chapter, chapter two, permission granted, permission denied, did focus on the two ethical standards, informed consent and recordings. Informed consent in the APA uh, ethics code is standard 3.10 and it states that psychologists must provide informed consent when conducting research or providing assessment, therapy, counseling, or consulting services in reasonably understandable language, which is important. Second, for individuals who are incapable of giving consent, psychologists must provide an explanation and seek assent or permission from the individual receiving services. Similarly, the recording standard is 4.03 and also dis discusses obtaining consent specifically for recordings, stating before recording the voices or images of individuals to whom they provide services, psychologists obtain permission from all such persons or their legal representative. Both of these standards help psychologists describe who, when, and how informed consent must be obtained, whether it be for therapy, assessment, or recordings, but really it's the ethical principles, specifically principle E, which provides the why that informed consent is important, which is to respect an individual's autonomy and right to self-determination. Our responses from our participants really reflected the standards with these ideas about when informed consent should be obtained who needs to consent versus assent, and how informed consent should be given. So for example, our participants discussed times when informed consent should be required, which included examples such as for medical procedures and participating in research, which were very similar to examples we find in psychology. However, many also noted how informed consent is important with dealing with contracts in business or any time that money is exchanged. For example, we had a, a hotel receptionist state, that's relevant to me because when I swipe a person's credit card at my other job, I have to give them a piece of paper and I have them sign at the top saying we're allowed to charge that credit card for the rate that's on the top and on the bottom saying they agree to not smoke in their non-smoking room or we can charge them a fee of $250. So anytime money was exchanged, our participants thought that was an important piece to have informed consent. When talking about who needed informed consent, our participants spoke broadly about adults needing informed consent for a variety of different reasons, though many emphasized the importance of assent with adults who didn't have capacity to make decisions, most of these being caretakers. Kids, on the other hand, were a different story. Though some noted that assent was important with children, often for parents, this wasn't necessarily true. For example, a nurse practitioner stated, as a mom, I have to make decisions with my husband, but not with my children's consent. In fact, it's better for them for us to make decisions for them. As they get older, I think it becomes more important when they each reach the age of reason. But right now, we have the authority to make decisions for them. Our participants also discussed how informed consent is obtained. 
While a few focused on verbal versus written delivery, several focused on the language that was used as being most important. One participant stated, which is a very broad example that I think applies to a lot of us. So if I take my car in and don't know anything about cars, they're using all this language about these parts that I don't know anything about. And they give me a bill for like, I don't know, $2,000. I'm like, wait a minute, can you break this down and explain it to me a little bit more? So with the informed consent portion of the chapter, several participants did discuss why informed consent is important. However, with the section on recordings, participants were especially focused on why it's important to ask people permission, also noting that at many times in today's society, asking permission just doesn't happen. For example, as to why it's important, we had one participant state, my older sister posed a video of, or posted a video of my younger sister, and my younger sister was really angry because she doesn't like being on the internet. So she was extremely angry at my older sister, and my older sister had a hard time understanding why she was angry. So I had to explain it to her. You violated her confidentiality. She needs to know that she's not being put on the internet. It's not fair to her what you're doing when you're doing that against her will. It came down to why it is important to ask permission. However, yet many of our participants really paid most attention to the fact that with surveillance culture and the use of camera phones being so ubiquitous, many, many times you're not given the opportunity to give permission in today's society. One participant stated, you see all these people taking photographs of people and misusing them. So consent is important, but it's not happening in our society. And what's the truth? You're hurting people. So in this chapter, we found that the conversations about informed consent, whether it be for consent to record or for services, participants agreed that it's important for psychologists and non-psychologists alike. They noted the who, the what, the how of the informed consent process can help protect ourselves and others but it was the why we seek permission that's so relevant to everyone that it comes down to respecting ourselves and others. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, Courtney, that was a, a wonderful overview of informed consent. And we're now moving to a, a related issue, which is that of privacy. And Brooke Bachman is going to talk about her chapter, minimizing intrusions on privacy and maintaining confidentiality. What limits and who sets those limits? Go ahead, Brooke. Thank you. Um, standard 4.04 of the APA Ethics Code tells psychologists that to minimize intrusions on privacy, we must include in written and oral reports and consultations only information germane for, to the purpose for which the communication is made. As chapter three points out, privacy and confidentiality are often used interchangeably, but there are distinctions between the two concepts. For psychologists, privacy is about what information we should share when given permission or consent to release information. Unless specifically requested, not all information needs to be released uh, when a client gives us permission to release information to a third party. So if a young woman was referred for an evaluation of possible ADHD for accommodations in her current college classes, to minimize intruding on her privacy, we may not include information about her medical history if it has no bearing on attention. More generally, however, privacy was initially related to the desire or right to be left alone, but now relates more to controlling the flow or collection of personal information, what we might call selective disclosure which is in line with standard 4.04. Our participants' answers primarily reflected the desire to disclose only relevant information for a specific intent or purpose, and they rated this concept as moderately relevant to their everyday lives. As it related to her job, a 28-year-old manufacturing technician stated, if anything were to be shared with their permission, it would not be things that needed to be kept private or anything that's not completely necessary. With regards to relevance to her personal life, an unemployed 27-year-old woman offered the following example. So I have a new friend and I'm trying to introduce them to my other friends. And I know that they might have had a history, but I don't tell them about that because I know that they're a good person and I don't want my new friend to judge them, so I don't tell them that. 
The second most common theme was the desire to keep information inaccessible to others, which also overlaps with the right to confidentiality. A 29-year-old program coordinator noted that at work, we can't have any socials, dates of births, phone numbers, names, addresses, any personal information whatsoever out on the desk that's not in a locked filing cabinet. So if we're working on a transaction and we have a form, it either has to be blank or shredded, digitized or in a locked cabinet because we don't want somebody else's information getting out there. However, a 36-year-old program coordinator stated that his way of protecting his privacy was, rule of thumb, I limit how much information I give just because I don't want my information all over the place. An outlying theme that may be particularly salient in understanding the importance of privacy protections in people's everyday lives is that of trust. As a 28-year-old female substitute teacher explained, students are not always comfortable sharing information with adults at face value because they don't really trust what you're going to do with that information. Maintaining confidentiality is also a way to build trust in relationships. Standard 4.01 reminds psychologists that we have a primary obligation to take and take reasonable precautions to protect confidential information obtained through or stored in any medium. Confidentiality typically refers to the process of entrusting another with assurances that their information will be safeguarded and implies that personal information is never to be revealed unless specific conditions are met and only if there are clearly delineated exceptions for preserving other safety. So not only is maintaining confidentiality concerned with the physical protection of information, so locked cabinets for files, encrypted or password protected digital files or air gapped computer systems. It demands that no information is shared by any means unless consent has been given. This standard was rated on average as being relevant in their everyday lives with the most frequent theme related to the legal requirements for maintaining confidentiality. So 59 year old hospital administrator felt confidentiality should be relevant for anyone who's managing personal identifiable information. So I expect the person that works in the social security office to maintain the same level of confidentiality that I expect of my psychologists or physicians. I expect the billing office in a hospital to maintain that as well. And it's a baseline expectation. While the majority of people identified the need to maintain confidentiality at work, many identified the importance of confidentiality for maintaining trust in relationships. A 51-year-old flight attendant stated, I do have a lot of friends and they tell me things. And I'm pretty good at keeping secrets. You know, I don't really want to engage in gossip. A 27-year-old student also provided an example of how protecting confidential information can affect trust. It's not my story. That's her thing. And she can say if she wants me to chime in at some point, that's the biggest thing in the military community is having friends you can trust because there are women out there and men out there you cannot trust. They'll go and tell anyone your deepest, darkest secrets. So I think you have to be very cautious with who you're open to and know that they're going to keep your information to themselves. Notably, some participants also identified times when confidentiality should be violated. A 74-year-old retired school nurse began by highlighting that maintaining confidentiality, even among friends, is so important. Sometimes you need to talk to uh, someone to talk to, but you don't want everyone in your circle to know about it. Maintaining confidentiality is really important in all relationships, unless, of course, someone's going to hurt themselves or hurt someone else. Then you have to speak up. Although the concepts of privacy and confidentiality are distinct, the responses from our interviewees indicate that personal information should be protected and is vital to maintain trust in relationships, whether personal or professional. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. That was a, a, a wonderful um, presentation about uh, the issue of privacy, which is so important today with, with social media. We're now going to another topic, which is conflicts of interest. And Sarah Detrick is going to talk about know the conflict, then you know the interest. Go ahead, Sarah. So the APA ethics standard 3.06 conflict of interest states, psychologists refrain from taking on a professional role when personal, scientific, professional, legal, financial, or other interests or relationships could reasonably, reasonably be expected to one, impair their objectivity, 
competence or effectiveness in performing their functions as psychologists, or two, expose the person or organization with whom the professional relationship exists to harm or exploitation. As psychologists, we must be continually and objective, objectively evaluating whether an action or interaction may in any way impair our judgment, provide overt or secondary gains, or in any way hurt or take advantage of another individual or party. This means ongoing self-evaluation and introspection is a crucial aspect of being able to both recognize and avoid potential conflict of interest. Through our research, we discovered that the importance of not only recognizing a conflict of interest, but navigating it appropriately transcends professions, relationships with others, and even with oneself. While disseminating our research, several interesting themes emerged, such as potential legal ramifications, impairment of judgment, losing or maintaining credibility and trust, the role of gifts, bribes, and incentives. Additionally, specific professions were identified as being riddled with challenging conflict of interest situations to include teaching, sales, physical therapy, and analytics. Of particular interest was the impact conflict of interest have within relationships with others, but perhaps more importantly with oneself. The idea of poor self-care may not stand out as a natural impediment to avoiding conflict of interest, but research has shown that when we are not taking care of ourselves, our ability to recognize and avoid conflict of interests is diminished. The following is a small sampling of some valuable insights presented by our participants. A teacher stated, you have to refrain from your personal opinion, your personal belief becoming part of the conversation. A journalist reported conflicts of interest in journalism, they destroy the validity and credibility of the journalist and of the paper and so that's the thing that you want because credibility is something that takes a really long time to build up and it can be taken away in an instant. A male diversity and inclusion manager stated, I think of favoritism. I have been exposed to people who work with vendors or any other relationship they have. Most have bent the rules for themselves and it put in an interest with that relationship almost like bribery, gifts, rewards, things like that. Some participants found that overlap in their personal and professional worlds was a common reality, regardless how they felt about it. For example, a female hospitality worker noted, in the hospitality industry, there's sort of always a conflict of interest because in order to bring back repeat customers, you kind of have to dig in and like be in that friend relationship. A businesswoman also shared, my boss is my friend on Facebook and it brings up conflicts. I like her personally, but when we have a stressful business relationship, I don't want her on my page seeing my business. A retired female professional took a philosophical approach by asserting that conflict of interest is sort of in the eye of the beholder. For most of us, as one researcher suggested, Expecting entirely biased free behavior is unrealistic. Perhaps the best way to mitigate this would be transparency. Transparency and accountability are essential for all professions, whether it be for psychologists, financial advisors, government officials, physicians, or pharmaceutical companies that publish studies about drug safety and effectiveness. Each role warrants full disclosure of any potential conflict of interest as a matter of assuring maximum objectivity and public trust. In closing, the ethics standard 3.06 conflict of interest that was initially created for psychologists appears to have relevance to people in all walks of life. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was a, a wonderful presentation. And we're now continuing with our next subject, 
which is, of course, another very pertinent subject from today's headlines. Uh, Joshua Green is going to talk to us about challenging interactions, exploitative relationships, multiple relationships, and avoidance of sexual relationships with student and supervisees. Go ahead, Joshua. Hi, everyone. So chapter five focuses on relational elements within psychological ethics and is centered around challenging interactions, whereby our findings about standards of exploitative relationships multiple relationships and avoidance of sexual relationships with students and supervisees are examined and discussed. The chapter begins with a quote given by a mother. She said, to be honest, people use people to get places and that's how life is. Our introductory statements for this chapter frame some of the reasons for problematic professional relationships. In our study, we kept coming back to one word, complacency though this may seem like a rather unobvious choice. However, when considering each of these three ethic standards, at the heart of each is a suggestion that complacency has taken over and that people who engage in these behaviors are likely rationalizing what is clearly unethical behavior. Alternatively, to push past complacency, one must have the motivation to be excellent, to be unwilling to compromise one's standards and even be selfless in some circumstances regardless of the underlying root cause. When people find themselves inveigled in a quagmire of multiple relationships, exploitative relationships, or inappropriate sexual relationships, these more noble and ethical motivations are clearly lacking. Our first standard, exploitative relationships reads, psychologists do not exploit persons over whom they have supervisory, evaluated, or other authority, such as clients, patients, students, supervisees, research participants, and employees. We believe this interview item may have generated some degree of puzzlement since perhaps exploitation is not a topic that most people frequently consider in their everyday conversations, even as some occurrences of exploitation are at various junctures a part of our own lives. One of the participants in our study asked, what do they mean by exploit? Another participant, a nail technician, asked if we could explain the standard a bit further. The next standard, multiple relationships, concerns professionals being involved with clients in multiple capacities. In the field of clinical psychology, for example, it is not uncommon for psychologists to be asked by friends or acquaintances to provide some services to themselves or for loved ones. Even more commonly, Friends or acquaintances might ask a psychologist for casual psychological advice. In these situations, psychologists run the risk of impairing their clinical judgment because of factors that increase the potential for exploitation or impaired objectivity, such as personal biases or, and emotional investments. The best course is for a psychologist in that situation to make a referral to another clinician. Upon interviewing many of our participants, it became clear that the idea of multiple relationships was oftentimes confusing, and in some cases, it was not well comprehended. Among all of the other ethics standards that we presented and defined for our participants, the standard of multiple relationships evoked the most questions and puzzlement. Participants would sometimes confuse the idea of multiple relationships with sexual relationships, asking for clarification with questions such as, May I question what a multiple relationship is? And so are we talking about a sexual relationship or just relationships? And also, is that like multiple sexual partners or a client or a friend? Thus, confusion about the concept of multiple relationships was a primary theme in itself with about 48 occurrences. In addition, our findings supported that some persons expressed having no problems with encouraging or promoting multiple relationships with clients or coworkers. As a tax account, accountant explained, everything is teamwork based. So we have to have a strong relationship to get the work done. We have relationships inside and outside to bond. It is encouraged. We will go out for drinks together where a partner takes us out and pays for everyone. Similarly, an attorney responded, I've been in situations where I've represented friends. When I was in private practice, I didn't see this as being a huge problem. A restaurant worker stated, 
that one's hard because for me in the restaurant business, we have a lot of relationships outside of it. So many of my customers become my friends. So for me, that's not necessarily relevant because in the hospitality industry, everyone kind of forms relationships with their customers. In spite of much confusion about the standard, nurse practitioners seem to understand that the idea of multiple relationships uh, was relevant when she explained that when she was faced with treating her own son, she couldn't treat him and that she didn't want to treat him because she was too emotionally involved. So she referred to a collaborating provider to see him as a patient. The final standard of the chapter, sexual relationships with students and supervisees reads that psychologists do not engage in sexual relationships with students or supervisees who are in their department, agency, or training center, or over whom psychologists have or are likely to have evaluative authority. While the majority of these responses appeared to cast a negative light on this kind of behavior, some participants felt that it was acceptable if both parties were consenting. Those individuals stated that it was okay if it did not lead to breaches of workplace ethics or eventuate in favoritism. A female device, diversity officer said, as long as it doesn't lead to favoritism, then it's okay. Some participants stated that such behaviors had occurred in their professional settings frequently and that they themselves had personal experience in that regard. Rather strikingly, a participant said, to be honest, that is how I met my husband. And I'm going to conclude there. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. That's a, a fascinating subject. And we're staying with that for a moment, uh, the, the issue of sexual harassment, because Shereka McKay is going to talk to us about times up on silence, sexual harassment and other harassment. Go ahead, Shereka. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. As many are likely aware, harassment, unfortunately, is a frequently occurring phenomenon that has become a pervasive problem in today's society. Routinely characterized as an extreme form of othering, this deleterious behavior involves the hostile treatment or intentional targeting of others, typically for the purpose of establishing one's dominance or creating an unfavorable power control dynamic. Consequently, its occurrence often leaves those who are targeted feeling vulnerable as well as helpless. Hence, given both its impact and prevalence, increasing emphasis has been placed on establishing legislative and preventative measures to criminalize this occurrence while also aiming to protect and empower individuals who are unjustly targeted. In much the same way, the APA has established standards within the ethics codes that embody this preventative stance, aiming to separately distinguish sexual harassment from other hostile behaviors. The sexual har harassment standard, standard 3.02, prohibits psychologists from engaging in sexually harassing behaviors, whether verbal or nonverbal, that are unwelcomed, offensive, or create a hostile educational or workplace environment. The standard also states that practitioners should avoid engaging in sexually related behavior that is adequately serious or intense enough to be perceived as abusive within a given context to any reasonable person. Notably, this behavior when it occurs can be per perpetuated as a single severe or intense act, or it can also emerge as a chronic pattern of several pervasive acts. In much the same way, other harassment behaviors, which may be displayed as unwelcome inappropriate jokes, verbally abusive epithets, or physical attacks, are also regulated by the ethical codes of conduct under standard 3.03, .03, which prohibits psychologists from knowingly engaging in these behaviors, among others, towards persons with whom they interact with in their work based on socio-demographic factors, including age, gender, and race, among other factors. Hence, because of the emphasis that is placed on these standards in the work that we do, we desire to understand their relevance and application in the lives of those who are not psychologists. In relation to sexual harassment, we found that this standard was moderately relevant among our participants and showed a significant correlation with other ethics standards, including unfair discrimination, multiple relationships, and conflict of interest. In examining the applicability of this standard, one stay at home mom who was also homeschooled her children conveyed a sense of agency and the importance of teaching protection by stating, training children to protect themselves, to protect their privacy, teaching them that God gave them their body, 
and that it's so wonderful and part of how we protect our body is to keep it covered and talk about modesty in our dress and modesty in our speech and what to do if somebody was kind of encroaching on that privacy. In contrast, another teacher responded in a way that emphasized the attributes of one's financial or immediate physical environment and how this can potentially lead to development of maladaptive boundaries in connection with possibly infringing upon others' personal space. To this, she responded, it depends on what they grow up in. Kids who grew up in a family where their parents live in a studio apartment. So they've got a kitchen, they've got a bathroom that has a door on it, but everything else is an open room. However, what was most interesting was the discovery that in workplace settings, this behavior seemed to be more ambiguous with less clarity around potential expressions of its occurrence or even its existence normalized. For instance, a female library technician commented, sexual harassment seems to happen often and be sort of a norm in the workplace, especially in the corporate environment. Similarly noting this perceived tolerance, a male laboratory tech emphasized gender composition as influencing certain workplace behaviors. To this, he responded, there are different jokes and different things people say. I'm trying to think of different things, like you can definitely see different tones or ways people talk, especially when there's more males or females or a mix. Like in the labs that I've worked in, things might come out of someone's mouth a little more easily depending on who's around. Equally, when looking at the other harassment standards, several interesting narratives were also revealed. For instance, underscoring the significance of race and social context, one African-American student stated, I would definitely think this one would come up with me personally having to deal with, especially as a black man. Sometimes I feel like I'm har harassed just because of my race, or sometimes as a male, I feel like I'm already viewed or treated differently because of how I'm different from the people around me. I feel like it's a big, big problem. Just the divide in America right now, and especially just between races and genders in this ethnic culture as a whole. Whereas in other instances, several respondents narratives pointed to other harassment being determined by one's perception, reflecting a fine line perspective, or even creating a sense of cohesion and solidarity, in which I will end my segment of this presentation with a quote that was shared by one of our female participants who commented, like all of my friends, that I'm really close to, like we can joke around with each other and we can make jokes about not all of this stuff, but some of it, like our age. We'll be like, oh, you're so old, but it's just a joke. But I know like in a work environment, I know that it's not tolerated, so I wouldn't. But like with close friends, you know, you joke around and say stuff and like they know it's a joke. Thank you. Thank you, Shiraka. That was a wonderful presentation. And we're going to stay in that realm for a little bit, uh, because in a minute, uh, Kanti Raja is going to talk to us about, is it time to question the single story, the unfair discrimination in our everyday lives? And before she does that, I just want to uh, say, if you're interested in getting the book, it is on Amazon in both uh, printed and electronic ebook version, plays wonderfully on your iPad or Galaxy or iPhone. Uh, just search for psychology ethics and add either Dr. Hatcher's or Dr. Jacquin's last name. And with that, I'm handing it over to Conti. Thank you. <clears throat> Chapter seven seeks to provide insight into the current complexities regarding unfair discrimination. The APA ethical code reads, in their work-related activities, psychologists do not engage in unfair discrimination based on age, gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, culture, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, disability, socioeconomic status, or any basis prescribed by law. In their professional lives, psychologists use this standard to guide their practice. Psychologists make efforts to educate themselves about the values, needs, and ways of being of different populations in order to respect the individual perspectives of their clients. The complexity of this issue is encapsulated by a quote from a retired school nurse. I think we all try to be as fair as possible, but I think there's always a little bit of personal skew to things. You try to be fair in dealings with people, but there are times when other things affect how you think about it. This chapter includes a variety of perspectives that reflect the interpretation of the standard in our participants' daily lives. 
The question we attempt to answer is how can we honor the multitude of stories that exist within our country and is it time? Our participants' narratives identified many aspects of unfair discrimination, including the role of individual differences, the influence of childhood experiences, the negative impact of unfair discrimination on relationships, and the role of personal responsibility. While some narratives encourage avoidance of this topic, the vast majority of our participants expressed a desire to change and a belief that change is possible. These desires came alive through our participants' discussions of the moral, aspirational, and religious relevance of the standard. For example, a 70-year-old retired female confessed, you know, I think that's, someone, that's something one aspires to. I recall getting on an elevator with a person that was very different from me, and I was uncomfortable until that person got off. That was nothing but my own bias. I see it as more aspirational than what really happens. Similarly, a physical therapist stated, Many of the patients I see come from a low socioeconomic status. I have quite a few patients who are from different cultures and speak different languages. I still have to care for them and treat them with the same dignity and respect. I had a patient recently who was a boy identifying as a girl. Initially, I had a really hard time preparing myself to treat this patient. After reflecting and thinking about the situation, knowing that I was still called to care for them with the same dignity and respect, if not a greater dignity and respect, aside from my personal beliefs. <clears throat> Implicit bias, perception, and the presence of assumptions were also identified as perpetuating discriminatory behaviors. In this sense, unfair discrimination was described as being hidden and subtle. This was described by a female electrical engineer. Unfair discrimination can happen in the engineering world because men don't always think that women are equal. Women can be talked down to because the men think they don't know the information or have the capacity to learn the new technology. A 25-year-old hotel concierge stated, I do not discriminate. I can, however, use the hotel as an excuse if there's someone who wants to check in, someone who has a certain look about them or they have a ton of people with them. I'm allowed to refuse service but I'm not to allowed to refuse service using any of those things that you mentioned. The negative assumptions made in this statement contrast with the participants' positive assumptions about a customer with a service animal to whom the participant provided a quality service. Technology was another area discussed by several participants. For example, a library technician stated, when all you get is filtered through the news, you don't even know. So yes, unfair discrimination is relevant and it's becoming more relevant. A 22-year-old male nursing student offered an additional perspective on the role of technology in furthering assumptions and the potential for unfair discrimination. Especially with social media, he says, it's becoming more superficial. Even things like how common people use like Tinder, and that's like straight up discrimination in an app. I feel like discrimination is always going to be unfair, but we've twisted it to be justified to get like dates or love or whatever. And some people identify their group so much for group cohesion and safety. At the same time, you're using discrimination to discriminate against yourself and a conceived safety. Finally, our participants' narratives reflected ways that unfair discrimination is being combated. Several areas mentioned include workplace policies and ethical codes, such as the description of an intern in a workplace setting. There are strict rules in place to accommodate if someone comes with an issue. The intern last year, he came with mental issues. He was in the hospital and he struggled through the year. He was gone for quite some time and we accepted him back. We helped him accommodate and support him through completing his internship. A teacher working in an urban school district addressed the importance of adequate training. My daughter works with HIV and AIDS patients. She's had training to desensitize her to some of their issues, so she's all right. But the average layperson, I can't do that. I don't have the training. So while it is clear that the dimensions of this issue are just beginning to be explored, our participants' narratives offer hope that the desire, intention, and motivation are present along with the beginnings of policy and law needed to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kanti. And I, uh, I hope you share my impression uh, of the incredible breadth of this study that you all have been working on. I mean, this is really a study that talked to people from all walks of life. And, and that's what so impressed me when I first saw the manuscript. And, and I hope you, you share that same enthusiasm. 
We're now going to a slightly different topic, something that is very germane for us as professors. And that is, uh, Jared Gonzalez is going to talk about, is it time to question the single story? And he's particularly talking about un, uh, delegate, I'm sorry, not a one person show, sorry about Jared. It's a talk about delegation of work and publication credit, which is, happens to be a, a topic that we are very uh, concerned about at the University Press. So go ahead, Jared. Thank you. Uh, APA standard 2.05 is entitled Delegation of Work to Others and says, psychologists who delegate work to employees, supervisees, research or teaching assistants, or who use the services of others, such as interpreters, take reasonable steps to, one, avoid delegating such work to persons who have multiple relationships with those being served that would likely lead to exploitation or loss of objectivity, two, authorize only those responsibilities that such persons can be expected to perform competently on the basis of their education, training, or experience, either independently or with the level of supervision being provided. And three, see that such persons perform these services competently. So the manner in which psychologists use this standard obviously varies. Psychologists may utilize assistance from others to complete the work they are responsible for. Typically, there is a mutual benefit, such as payment to an employee, education credit to an assistant, and knowledge or experience to supervisees. A psychologist may delegate work to others in many instances. Some examples include that they may use an office manager for financial and billing purposes. They may use a practicum student who may assist in an evaluation and may engage in report writing or scoring tests. And they may use a research assistant who may engage in data entry or recruiting participants. Our interviews indicated that there are also examples of how non-psychologists view and maybe even use this standard. There are several themes that we found. The first theme being that there is delegation of work in families. One of our participants stated, I delegate work to my fiance and I'll say, you do this. And I'll say, take out the garbage because I don't want to clean the toilet because I don't want to. Another theme was teamwork. An IT expert noted, being a member on my team at work and having employees report to me, I must delegate work to others to ensure that they have the appropriate amount of time to complete the work that needs to be done. The next theme is trusting the competence of others. Another participant said, you can't do everything by yourself in life, but I have a problem with this. I try to do most things on my own because I'm not sure that it will work if I trust others too much. And another theme was that there's no delegation happening one participant said, this is also a weakness of mine. I'm terrible at delegating because I always end up doing it myself. And that's applicable to my work life and my personal life. And the final theme that we found in delegating was delegating in a classroom. As one teacher noted, professionally as teachers, we delegate work to each other. We share responsibilities, we delegate. I'd say between my coworkers and myself and even administration, we try to share responsibilities. We also felt as a group that there was an additional standard that fell under the scope of delegation, and that's delegating research and authorship responsibilities. APA standard 8.12a states that psychologists take responsibility and credit, including authorship credit, only for work they've actually performed or to which they have substantially contributed. When we shared the standard with our participants, roughly 60% of the participants stated that they believed appropriate credit should be given based on one's contribution to a group project and that credit should be given where it was due. As one participant stated, if I publish something or do something, I do take all the credit for it. But if I'm doing it with someone else, I give them the credit as well. There was also a small percentage of individuals in our sample who stated that the standard for publication credit was not necessarily applicable to their lives. As one caregiver stated, I think that is irrelevant at this time because I'm not publishing anything right now in my work as a caregiver. Approximately 9% of our sample stated that individuals take credit 
for all kinds of things when they should not be doing so. I mean, if I was speaking at a conference, whatever topic I was speaking on, I would hope that it would be mine, but I can't guarantee that there aren't times where people walk in and take the credit. Approximately 9% believe that their good deeds went unrecognized. As one teacher stated, we get credit for nothing that we do. When you're a teacher, you just have to assume that you're not getting the credit for anything. You never get the pat on the back for something good. In closing, delegation appears to be a part of everyone's life, whether it be choosing to work as a team or who gets credit for what. This topic appears to be one that is taken into consideration by non-psychologists. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. This is such an important issue, and uh, not just for the, uh, the clinical uh, activity, but also for publishing and you organizations. I mean, so often do we hear about employees who don't feel that they are given due credit for any innovations or developments that they develop for their bosses. So this chapter is, is extremely important. And so thank you, Jared, for, for your presentation about that. We're going back to uh, Brooke Buckman, and she's talking about a related issue, namely uh, to trust or not to trust. And that means applying ethical standards for plagiarism and other deceptions. Go ahead, Brooke. Standard 8.11 states psychologists do not present portions of another's work or data as their own, even if the other work or data source is cited occasionally. For us, this usually occurs in research or academic settings, but it appears to have moderate relevance outside of academia. A 37-year-old temp worker explains, you're not only taking someone else's work, it's like you didn't just steal the sneakers, you put them on, which is a whole other level. Plagiarism ought to be a kind of value that goes beyond just writing or taking someone else's work. We ought not steal. And we certainly ought not to be arrogant enough to steal and then show it off like you earned it. That's even worse. The most common theme was the importance of giving proper credit. A 31-year-old engineer said, you should never be citing someone else's work as your own. That goes for things on a blog or whatever. I mean, it's just a matter of your work is your own work. And a 28-year-old music teacher pointed out that if you work really hard on something, you don't want someone taking credit for what you did. Sometimes plagiarism is normalized. A 28-year-old pastor described how a lot of pastors take titles of sermons and sermon series from other pastors, and they may credit them, but oftentimes they don't. And a lot of ministries say, take all our resources. So it's not really viewed as plagiarism. A 31-year-old IT manager provides another example. At work, if I need to write a how-to document, I find a copy online. I tweak it so it pertains to my situation 100%, but I don't have to reference that person at all because the document I create is for internal use only. But some reported plagiarism isn't always intentional. A 44-year-old consumer fraud rep stated, I do feel like there's a gray area there too where you've just kind of stood on the shoulders of somebody's ideas. A 34-year-old pastor also noted, oftentimes uh, there are things that you hear so many times that you don't even know where it started. Themes also reflected the negative consequences of plagiarism, such as the 52-year-old journalist who noted you lose credibility or the 49-year-old director of broadcasting who said it's illegal because there's copyright infringement. If you don't follow these contracts, then they can sue you, hold you liable, and pull a contract. An outlying theme suggested the relevance of plagiarism is situational. A 23-year-old nail tech said, we copy people's work all the time. Maybe if it was a more formal system, it would be a bigger deal. If I was writing an article or drawing or painting something and found inspiration in someone else's work, I would most definitely mention their name. It's just a form of respect. Standard 5.01 mandates that psychologists do not make false, deceptive, or fraudulent statements concerning their training, experience, or competence, their academic degrees, their credentials, their institutional or association affiliations, their services, the scientific or clinical basis for or the results or degree of success of their services, their fees, or their publications or research findings. This is one way we cultivate and maintain the trust necessary for our work. More generally, this ethical tenet spoke to the extreme relevance of not lying to others. 
As a 37-year-old temp worker put it, humans, we lie for a number of reasons and for a number of purposes. It's important being true and honest and authentic about who you are. We would hope if everyone did that, folks would be able to lead the life they want to lead. The primary theme reflected the importance of accurate self-presentation and the negative consequences of lying. A 49-year-old associate director said, I was sitting in a hiring committee one time and someone lied on their resume. Not only was his resume thrown out, but when that person applied for other positions within the institution, they weren't even considered because they'd lied the first time. Another common thing related to how lying violates trust. An unemployed 28-year-old said, you wanna make sure that you trust the person in front of you because when you lie, it's a domino effect of how many lines you're gonna to have to create out of that and how many people you've heard out of each lie. Deception isn't always seen as problematic though, as long as someone finds justification. A 19 year old temp worker said, in applying for a job, I don't make false statements pertaining to my credentials or my academic degrees. I might stretch the experience out, but it's mostly true. A 23 year old tax accountant said, when I just started and I did my year end client, I was billing the client as an experienced associate who worked for the firm for three years. I think that's deceptive, the firm doesn't. People also lie to persuade or entertain. An unemployed 21 year old said, it's just natural in human nature. Like when somebody tells you a story like, well, I fought like five people and it's really two because everybody falsifies something in their life to make it better or even to make it worse. But when we lie has limits, like when the belief we're honest needs protecting. An unemployed 23 year old pointed out, you should be honest with yourself and others. Deceiving is very, very bad for your own personality. Intentions also mattered. As a 66-year-old electrician highlighted, if you can't tell them the truth, that means you have some sort of nefarious plan, even if it's keeping yourself from getting in trouble. Interestingly, only 12 participants provided an example of how this was relevant in their personal lives, while the vast majority gave examples of its relevance in their work life. However, what we lose when we're deceptive, perhaps for any reason, was described perfectly by a 38-year-old escrow agent. One thing that is very uh, uh, important is for people to trust you, to be a person of integrity, a person of honesty. That honesty is going to get them to relate, understand, trust me, share, and be open. If I break one of these, and when they do see that, I'm going to lose that connection and that trust, or they can feel safe or be able to come to me. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. And here to uh, introduce our next speaker, Jadwiga Otto, is our session host, uh, Hillary Molina. Take it away, Hillary. All right, hello, thank you. It's good to see everyone. We're gonna switch uh, directions a little bit here and go towards the topic of work and life. And I would like to introduce Yadi Otto, who will be talking about boundaries of competence, how to live and work like a pro. Thank you. Thank you. Chapter 10 discusses the ethical principle of boundaries of competence in psychology, which states that psychologists are providing services teach and conduct research with populations and in areas only within the boundaries of their competence based on their education, training, supervised experience, consultation study, or professional experience. Our study participants rated boundaries of competence as the second highest standard out of all the ethics standards used in the study. This finding indicates the strong relevance of this code to the everyday lives of our participants with the majority applying the standard to their employment or work-related activities. The discussions and narratives in this chapter demonstrate that boundaries of competence in the professional world have significant importance for the public's health, safety, and well-being. Similar guidelines are in place in the medical field, which is governed by licensing boards. For example, a nurse in our study described. In nursing, it's called your scope of practice. So you can only do things that are within your scope of practice. Otherwise, if you try to go above it, it's considered unsafe and you could hurt somebody. And the people you delegate underneath you, they can't go beyond their scope of practice. A physical therapist nicely illustrated the idea of knowing your role and staying within the boundaries of your training in our study. She noted that competency is extremely relevant for her profession. Based on my experience as a physical therapist, I provide care for a patient who needs help working on gross motor skills or becoming stronger or strengthening or stretching a muscle. 
I'm not going to provide medication or medical advice that is outside of my scope of practice that a physician might provide. Additionally, this ethical standard serves as a mandate for many legal professions and guides legal and ethical guidelines to ensure the public receives the best possible service and care. One of our participants, an attorney, expressed her view on boundaries of competence. Competency is extremely relevant, most notably within people's professions. They need to be competent in what they do. In my profession as an attorney, I would not feel comfortable, much less able to tell someone what laws might be in a field that I have no experience in. Ethical codes and guidelines govern many different professions that directly impact our quality of life. Thus, the book chapter further discusses how specific skill sets, such as self-awareness and metacognitive skills for accurate self-assessment are crucial when evaluating one's competence. Additionally, our participants discussed possible consequences when acting outside the bounds of their competence. The impact of that kind of pitfall can be quite serious in some professions. As one study participant, a volunteer medical first responder and rescue squad member pointed out, if I lie, somebody could die. If I'm not competent to do what I do, then that somebody could die or get hurt. With clearly defined boundaries of competence, the concept of collaboration was another important theme that also highlighted the ability to recognize one's limitations. For example, a teacher in our sample noted the importance of referrals by stating, if I have a student who is having suicide ideation, then I'm going to refer them to our school counselor. I'm going to stick with what I'm trained in, education. Many professions are guided by strict guidelines that require adherence to boundaries of competence. However, based on the responses of our research participants and in tandem with multidisciplinary research that explores the topic of boundary crossing competencies, a trend was observed that points to an often challenging balancing act between working within the boundaries of competence and the need to address unique and unanticipated situations flexibly. One study participant, a teacher, shared her experience with this challenge. I teach eighth grade reading. I do things outside my competence and training. I don't just teach reading. I counsel kids, I'd say almost on a daily basis and give advice, which is not within my training. The chapter also discusses the benefits of attaining an attitude of viewing learning as a lifelong pursuit along with the idea that learning can challenge previous boundaries. This sentiment was expressed by one of our participants, an engineer who stated, yes, it would be to learn something new. It is not out of bounds, it's just learning. And with engineering, it's lifelong knowledge. It continually evolves. You can't just rely on your training. Sometimes you learn as you go. The participants in our study have overwhelmingly applied the ethical code of boundaries of competence in relation to their professional lives. This may be a surprising result to some readers as most individuals engage in everyday competence, which refers to a person's ability to perform a wide variety of tasks that are deemed critical for self-reliant living. In conclusion, this chapter provides insight into how boundaries of competence have significant importance for the public's health, safety, and well-being. However, boundaries of competence encompass so much more than just knowing one's role, as it includes the critical components of self-awareness and accurate self-evaluation. Lastly, boundaries of competence can be expanded via continuing education and training in the occupational domain and by adopting a curious mindset of being a lifelong learner. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this important research and really truly this is valuable across industries, very important work, thank you. And we're gonna stay in the topic of work and uh, introduce um, Courtney back. Uh, Courtney will be talking about life work spillover personal problems and conflicts. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Now, personal problems and conflicts is standard 2.06 of the APA Ethics Code, which states that psychologists must refrain from initiating an activity 
when they know or should know that there is a substantial likelihood that their personal problems will prevent them from performing their work-related activities in a competent manner. In psychology, we may define personal problems in many different ways, things that may contribute like substance use, mental health concerns, financial problems, legal problems, really anything that may cause enough of an issue to compromise one's competence. Yet, these problems are often not only personal problems, but interpersonal problems. Many of our participants identified interpersonal problems as the most likely issues to cause what we call spillover from home into work life. For psychologists, the tipping point is when a personal problem threatens the, the psychologist's ability to work with their clients and competence is impaired. For non-psychologists, there was a much greater continuum. First, several participants identified that spillover happens and it can cause some problems, though many of these problems are manageable. This was especially true for caregivers, both for the sick or elderly, but also for caregivers of children. For example, one participant, a teacher, said, I would be lying if I said that my personal life doesn't mix with my professional life. When it comes to problems, I mean, case in point, my kid stuck a bead up her nose and I had to leave work and all of my students knew what was going on. It wasn't hidden. While some of these problems are manageable, many participants also acknowledge that spillover can happen, though it may be something that they need to mask or cover up when reaching work. One teacher said, I don't really have a choice but to come in and teach every day or to work with students and to put on a smile. Anecdotally, I was really shocked by how many teachers use the exact same phrase that they have to leave it at the door, that personal problems are not welcome in the workplace. And there may be some professions or occupations where it is an expectation of the job to leave it at the door, whether it's a real or perceived expectation. Some participants focused on the idea that when spillover happens, it can become problematic at work. However, these examples really ranged from when someone is just having a bad day, which was my personal favorite quote, when your hairdresser has a bad day, they make you look crazy. Uh, or to more significant difficulties where participants really felt you cannot or should not work. Uh, one participant, a realtor, said, when I'm going through stuff, I can't really perform my task, especially if it's like a significant other in my family, a death, or if I'm going through stuff, I can't really focus on work. Finally, several participants noted that when it does become a problem at work, it's important to seek help when you need it. Though there was a range of responses about the supportiveness of the environments that our participants worked. A software engineer noted, so my boss and director are really good about that. I think it depends on who you work for. They both explained to me personal situations they've gone through. They have very support, they're very supportive and feel that family comes first. If there is something that needs to happen, they just say, come to us and we will make it happen. They're very supportive on that level. Alternatively, or alternatively, some in our study had bosses that did not reliably provide their desired level of support. One health inspector said, I've told my boss at times, I have a common cold, and he tells me that as long as you're washing your hands and taking care of yourself in that way, then you can still go do the inspection. In the wake of COVID-19, this, this was data was collected before that, um, that may be a very different response today. Finally, some participants found the most relevance in being on the receiving end of life work spillover, which was interesting. One participant said, you go to a doctor to get a medical opinion. They are supposed to be an expert. You don't want them to be coming to work if they have a personal issue because that could be a life or death situation. Now, it was rare that our participants couldn't think of an example of life spilling over into work, though some reported that it did not happen for them personally. Yet, should we have done this study during the pandemic, much like the earlier example, we may have had some different responses about the nature of life-work balance and the spillover that can occur. For many who are now working from home, or for some who may be feeling like they're living at work, the current situation provides a different perspective in the importance of managing life spilling over into work. It's a really delicate life-work balance, and managing it can be difficult in even the most quote-unquote normal of times. I believe that this standard might now be much more relevant to most people than ever before. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That uh, is is the work life balance right now. That is um, certainly something that's relevant. Um, and thank you so much for that research. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Sherry Hatcher, who is the co-editor of this book with Dr. Christine Jacqueline. And to close up, she'll be talking about giving psychology away and what ethical standards for individuals are in society. Dr. Hatcher, thank you. Thank you, Hillary, and good evening, everybody. Um, at least uh, from the time of George Miller's APA presidential talk in 1969, the idea of giving psychology away for benefit of society has spawned a sizable literature. What Dr. Miller said at the conclusion of his talk was, I can imagine nothing we could do that would be more relevant in human welfare and nothing that could pose a greater challenge to the next generation of psychologists than to discover how best to give psychology away. In the previous presentations, we described how we sought to understand whether and how some or all of 17 APA ethics standards might usefully apply to the everyday lives of adults who are not working in any of the mental health professions. As you heard, the 133 individuals who we interviewed represented a variety of occupations, from teachers to business managers, engineers, health workers, secretaries, students, firefighters, lawyers, law enforcement, stay-at-home parents, and more. Though a few people referenced societal issues in their responses, most participants' narratives reported personal life and workplace examples in applying the psychology ethics standards to their everyday lives. As Courtney and several others mentioned, when we first began this research project, it was two years prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected so much of the world. This traumatizing situation, as we all know, is still developing as we meet today. The COVID-19 public health crisis has made it abundantly apparent that ethics issues abound for societal considerations in addition to holding personal relevance for individuals. Were we now to ask our participants how the psychology ethics codes apply to their everyday lives, they might have referenced the many ethics issues arising during this pandemic. The ethical moral fiber involved for behaving in ways that benefit the greater societal good has been impressively demonstrated by many people, though not all, during this pandemic. Individuals staying at home while benefiting from others who had to go out to work often expressed great appreciation for essential workers. For example, in New York City, a ground zero for the pandemic in spring 2020. At 7 p.m. each evening, a clatter of shouting, utensil banging, and other forms of noise making rang out from apartment windows and homes around the city, signaling a cacophony of appreciation for the frontline hospital workers um, who were uh, really having uh, patient overloads, incredibly long hours and uncommon degrees of patient deaths along with health risks to themselves. And it sounded something like this. And it went on with instruments and cheers and so on for the health workers. Some individuals, such as a young neighbor residing in one of our own communities, offered to help others by picking up medicine, food, or taking out garbage cans. This type of pro-social behavior manifested as an expression of personal ethical standards in a time of crisis. Following are some examples of how the COVID-19 pandemic crisis has raised a wide variety of concerning issues Embodying in the, embodied in the 17 psychology ethics standards that we illustrated with our research findings and participant narratives 
and presented in the same order um, as earlier. For example, regarding the standard of informed consent, those who tested positive for the COVID-19 virus were obliged to inform public health officials about others with whom they had interacted so that contact tracing and quarantine could be effected. But informed consent was not reliable. Regarding an example of relaxing of privacy and confidentiality protections during the pandemic, it was well publicized when a lawyer in Westchester, New York became a super spreader of the virus to hundreds of other individuals as a result of having attended large group events prior to falling ill. His name and photograph were published in national newspapers and appeared on television. Issues of conflicts of interest emerged between those following the safest public health guidelines to stem the spread of the pandemic versus efforts to reopen a rapidly failing economy. Regarding the standard of ex exploitation, it was viewed by many as exploitative to demand that frontline hospital workers show up to care for others without benefit of proper protective equipment for themselves. And other essential workers, such as delivery persons, mail carriers, trash collectors, warehouse workers, and food chain suppliers, not only had insufficient protective equipment, but they were not necessarily well compensated for their essential work. Regarding harassment, in addition to um, uh, the kind of uh, lack of privacy of for infected individuals such as the Westchester person I had mentioned previously, individuals who were presumed to be of Chinese descent were sometimes harassed in that the virus was thought to have originated in China. And there was unfair discrimination also in that minority communities had least access to protections and often most exposure. Many minority employees did not have the luxury to stay home during the pandemic. Now considering the standard of delegation of work to others, this manifested when the federal government relegated responsibility to governors for securing protective testing equipment that at protective and testing equipment that was not uh, readily available to states. And as a result, many governors were angry about a lack of coordinated federal effort to gain essential medical and protective supplies, and now also vaccines. Regarding false and deceptive statements, fake cures and claims for curing COVID-19 abound on the internet. And some government officials made unfounded claims in proclaiming that the virus would simply disappear or by recommending unproven treatments and in publicly underestimating the prevalence and lethality of COVID-19, all of which flies in the face of science and public health expertise. Considering boundaries of competence, government officials imparted irresponsible advice sometimes, including offering medical opinions beyond their training or competence, and doctors were unhappy and are unhappy with the possibility of having to ration care as one physician complained, it's God's decision who lives or dies, noting that such decisions were well beyond the boundaries of their competence. And finally, about personal problems, adults and children needing to stay socially isolated has led to increases in anxiety and depression, as well as economic hardship. And frontline physicians and nurses have reported feeling overwhelmed by unprecedented numbers of patients needing to be put on ventilators and by the uncommon numbers of patients who sadly died on their watch. Considering the parameters of this pandemic tells us that we need to internalize ethical guidelines and standards such as those suggested by the APA code so that they are reliably present as each of us makes decisions in our everyday lives and that those responsible for legislating the welfare of society consider what constitutes ethical governance 
and leadership for benefit of others. I'd like to end with a quote that appears on the back of our book from Dr. Patricia Gurin, who is distinguished University of Michigan professor. She noted that our book stresses the importance of our quote, understanding how people apply ethical norms at a time when some imagine Americans to be more motivated by self-interest than by considering the ethical impact of their behaviors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatcher. Um, in closing here, I would just like to say thank you uh, to all of the contributing authors and to Dr. Hatcher and Dr. Jacqueline. I just appreciate this time. This is such an impressive uh, breadth and depth of research and um, you all have provided outstanding and valuable research um, to, the, to the psychology community. So I would like to, uh, before we close, make sure that uh, you know you can find the book online on Amazon, uh, Psychology, Ethics, and Everyday Life. And also a thank you to Jean-Pierre for uh, making this all come together. Thank you everyone for joining us who are online tonight. Take care, goodbye.